Hi all, let's look at Kasparov in round five. So Kasparov playing against, I'm going to give you the pronunciation from Chess Gamescom. Jan Nepomnishi. And so that once more. Jan Nepomnishi. Okay, so playing with the white pieces kicks off with d4. We have knight f6, c4, g6. We go into a Grunfeld, knight f3, bishop g7. And now a surprise move from Kasparov. The most usual is queen b3 here, or c takes d5. But here we have the surprising h4, trying to get the game into less theoretical uh, chances. Uh, so c6 is played. With this, black is giving an intention that he might be taking on c4 and trying to hold on to his pawn. And in general, black's strategy is based on light square grip. It's not just about taking the pawn, it's trying to get a big grip on the light squares. So bishop g5, we do see this, d takes, e4, bishop e6, so clinging on to the pawn. e5, and we have uh, what seems to be quite a nice knight on d5 here. Uh, it's not possible to take on c4 in this position because the knight takes c3, hitting the queen and hitting the bishop. Uh, so we have h5, and now knight d7. And black might be threatening to play h6 himself now to relieve some issues. So white actually plays it, cramping, it seems, black's position. Knight e4 has a very nasty threat to it, knight d6 check using that pin. F6 is played against that. The bishop drops back. And here, uh, white might actually be threatening to take the pawn here. This is protected. So it's not just about the pawn, it's about the, the light square grip. But can white undermine this structure? He tries to with a4. We have the bishop f5, the knight drops back. And here, um, from a technical point of view, maybe the bishop should just go back and ask white, you know, what what is he doing here? For example, bishop e2, queen b6, it seems fine. Uh, it seems about equal this position. But in the game, uh, actually e6 was played. And perhaps white can claim an advantage here by taking on f6. This didn't happen in the game. Uh, and for example, if bishop d6, then there's there's things like f7 check. So let's assume, uh, you know, this this position. It's it's a bit messy, but uh, it should be fine for white. But let's assume after uh, e takes, knight takes, this position actually is quite nice uh, for white. King's still in the center. These knights are kind of dangerous. So anyway, uh, we didn't get this. We After e6, white actually Smurf took on f5, which seems to relieve black's position a little bit, in theory. After e takes, a takes, c takes, bishop e2, and again, you know, here maybe uh, e, e takes just opening up that e5 score is, is useful for white. But bishop e2, bishop e7, white castles. a5 is played. So the king's still in the center, and Kasparov tries to exploit this now, this fact. He tries to undermine this pawn chain, trying to get onto this diagonal. And in fact, after c3, Yeah, this is now quite promising for white, this whole idea, exploiting the king in the center, basically. This c3 is a little bit on the dodgy side, but it's, you know, if black's already been on the, on this path of leaving the king a bit too long in the center, it seems. Um, now, it's on the dodgy side. Can you see what Kasparov plays here, which gives white uh, a promising position? 
Now, if I give you five seconds here, white to play. Okay, bishop takes b5. Yeah, ignoring the threat to the bishop, pinning the knight with e6 to follow. C takes d2, e6. This is great for white now, but after casting, it's the pawn which is really quite dangerous on e6. And Kasparov should, it seems, take the knight with the bishop. This leaves white with a very comfortable position, for example, like this. With that pawn on e6, even if d4 drops, this position, that pawn is only two steps away from queening and it's supported by the bishop of the queening square. So this is actually a, a nice advantage for white, this position. It's difficult even to get to that pawn to try and attack it. Unfortunately, yeah, Kasparov slipped up here with e takes d7, it seems. The forcing with knight c3, forking queen and bishop forces the issue. Check. Queen takes d4, and now queen takes d2, pardon me, and now knight e4, another forcing move, getting a tempo to collect what could have been a really dangerous pawn. And it leaves white in quite a weakened position, difficult to play, because there's a nice that queen's pawn here, a potentially weak liability pawn here. And uh, knight, knight d2 is played, which might not be the most accurate. So it's probably having difficulty readjusting here. Bishop d3, for example, might be better like this, where white should be able to hold uh, the balance. But uh, in fact, uh, he played um, here knight d2. Now, after knight takes d2, bishop b4. Yeah, black's in a very comfortable position now after queen d6 with the threat of queen f4. Rook a e rook a2. Rook a e8, and you see that this this file is difficult to contest. So black's in the driving seat. Queen f4 hitting that pawn. So black taking that pawn now. Yeah, black's just slightly better now. Queen g5. Rook takes. Rook takes. And here, uh, it's yeah, it's a difficult position with pressure on white. Perhaps best is a move like. Queen f3 is opposite color bishops. So sometimes these are quite tricky to uh, convert. But you know, this position has a lot of play left. But in the game, we see rook f7. Sorry, we see bishop f7. And can you see what black played in this position now? Uh, uh, very accurate move indeed is played in this position which shows how dangerous in can be at this time control yeah it shows how difficult he can be at this time control this next move if i give you five seconds black to play what would you play here you might want to pause the video and analyze the position Okay, yeah, rook e3. It is really quite a crushing tactical blow. Uh, the first thing to be said about it, if it's not accepted, if the sacrifice is not accepted, just f3 check. And here, rook e1, checkmate, ouch. Yeah, king g1, rook e1 is going to be uh, mating like this. Yeah. Okay, so that's quite a cruel blow here. So it's taken, but now queen takes and f3, threatening both queen g2 mate and queen e1 mate. And the game ended here. There is a way for white to parry against the mates, funny enough, <laughs> which is quite surprising. Because we've resigned here, but if he wanted to play on, there is rook takes h7, which I know looks crazy and pointless, but. Uh, Black had sacrificed the rook already, so 
discontinuation, giving up Rook and Bishop. Unfortunately, in this end game, this pawn is heading for a dark square which can be supported by the bishop. So, for example, king f5, king takes, bishop c3, check here. Yeah. If we reach this sort of position, where white's going to be put in some in you know in a zugzwang soon, so say here dissolving black's pawn there, this is going to be winning for black because he's got the right bishop for the destination a pawn. Because Rav didn't want to play this out, having I mean, trusted in could do this, but yeah, there is there is that technical continuation. Rook takes h7 exists here if white wanted to play on. So yeah, Kasparov defeated here in this game. Nonetheless, you know, he had opportunities in this game, the major one being uh, to try and maintain that pawn on e6, which would have been a very, very advantageous scenario indeed. Okay, comments, questions, uh, likes, shares, appreciate it. Thanks very much.